Welcome to another edition of the Dogger Pass Podcast. This for UFC 300. The whole gang is here at Circus Studios. Cody Saptic, obviously, to my left. Your right, Pat Mayo. Jeff Feinberg's hanging out there. Maybe he'll yell something at some point. Uh, it's been a great little week down here yesterday. Busy travel day, but we couldn't leave you hanging. Obviously, the biggest card of the year. And uh, tons of time. What is there, like 10... 10 former champions on this card or something? Yeah, well, the UFC obviously took it seriously. UFC 300 it has to be a card of a big magnitude. They did an awesome job. They put together fights that the worst fight on the card headlines some shitty fight night somewhere. So, yeah, I think there's a huge excitement. And, of course, Rhett Stadium Swim, we're in Las Vegas. And you can start to feel that vibe, Paul. We went out on Fremont Street last night. It was whack. But beyond that, get up this morning. Because of the time difference, I got up pretty early. Walked through the lobby, and this lady's just bawling her eyes out. I don't know. Did she just lose her life savings, or is she mourning the death of O.J. Simpson? Nobody knows, <laughs> but the whole strip's just whack, man. I tell you what, there's a vibe. It's supposed to be a really hot day today, so uh, we're going to crump this show out and then uh, maybe hit a couple shoeies and cool down. And the haters will be happy to know the one thing I forgot. It's not that it, got, it didn't get pulled over at customs or anything like that. I forgot the r- rocket ship moon boob. Yeah, I think it got confiscated at uh, the border, but Paul's got his own story. I've seen the picture. It does look pretty legendary, so... It'll be back. We'll have to wait It'll for the debut on a future episode. But yeah, the haters rejoice just for one week here. All right, main event. We've got Alex Pereira taking on Jamal Hill for the light heavyweight championship of the world. Minus 135 for the champ, Alex Pereira. The former champ who never actually lost his belt, Jamal Hill, can be had for plus 115. Where are you at with this one, Code? Yeah, so again, this is a fight that you could flip-flop. There's no right or right, right or wrong answer. It really comes down to what version of each man shows up. So you got straight power versus straight volume. And Jamal Hill, I mean, he's a legitimate champion. A guy that, as Paul said, never lost his belt. But you look at these numbers, Paul. 232 significant strikes landed versus Glover Teixeira over the course of five rounds. So one, you know he can fight five rounds. Two, he's eclipsing 200 significant strikes. And this is not, this is the first time he did 200. But again, you know, against Dennis Stoicic, 101. On the Contender Series, he gets a second round finish, had landed 93. Against Thiago Santos, a fourth round finish, had landed 89. So again, Hill, not that he's not a a power puncher as well himself, it's just more so touch and go. Beautiful jab, long reach, plays it very smart. If he's going to win this fight over Alex Pereira, the blueprint's there. Just outvolume him. Again, Pereira is a murderous power puncher, but the volume's not quite there. He's looking to land 60, 70 significant strikes. The difference is he hits you 70 times, you curl over. Hill might have to hit you the 200 plus. What this one comes down to personally is what kind of shape is Jamal Hill in? So it's, it's well recounted that he's had the ankle injury. You know, he blows his Achilles tendon. He's been out for over a year now. The biggest concern is whenever you see him on social media, it doesn't really appear he's in fantastic shape. He carries on a little bit of extra weight. Mm -hmm. He's been banged up. No doubt he hasn't been in like a serious training camp. Now this card is loaded. UFC 300 is loaded. But they didn't have that crown jewel main event. They have this BMF title that they announced on the card. They got another title fight they announced on the card. But the fans start to say, where's that big fight? Where's Conor McGregor? Where's Ronda Rousey? Where's that one carrot dangling? Dana feels the pressure. UFC feels the pressure. So it seems like they slapped this matchup together. Now, Pereira's in awesome shape. Every time you see him on social media, he's just mean mugging, shredded to the bits, surrounded by killers, getting that work in. He's got a nasty left hook. He's looking to apply it. Hill, meanwhile, it almost feels like the UFC reached out to him and said, listen, we want to put this fight together with Alex Pereira. Hill's 32 years old. He hasn't fought in over a year. He just won the title, but he never got to defend it and get those big paydays. I'm sure they offered him a bag to take a fight on relatively short notice while he's not 100%. Now, if it's 100% versus 100%, I almost want to lean Hill. He's got the cardio. He's got the volume. He's got a cast iron chin. And flip side to Pereira, we've seen him hurt. We've seen him tired. And we've seen him kind of get outpointed at times. So... If everything's even and they're both 100%, I almost do favor Hill. I just can't wrap my head around how he would be 100% taking this fight on about six weeks and not being, you know, fully in shape. So you bounce back and forth. It's the main event. You can hedge if you got that far. You got to make a pick. I think I'm leaning Pereira because I want the guy that I know is going to come and put his best foot forward. Whereas Hill, he's going to fight his heart out. But if he's not at 100%, if I got a 100% Pereira versus a 75% Hill, Again, I lean ever so slightly towards Pereira, so I could see it going either way, volume versus power. I'm going to have to go with the power on this one. 
And unfortunately for, for Hill, he's never taken down anybody in zero. his UFC. Yeah. Zero takedowns. And his last fight was against Old Man Glover. And Old Man Glover is in Alex Pereira's corner. So they're going to be very, very familiar with this opponent heading into this fight. I'm with you. I'm, I'm laying the chalk. With strange. Alex Pereira, but I wouldn't be shocked, obviously, either way. Yeah, and, like, not a strange narrative, but also weird to me that Hill takes this fight and he immediately contacts Israel Adesanya for advice, which is fine, good thing to do. But it, to me, it speaks to the short notice of he's not fully prepared. His coaches didn't dissect it. His guys didn't break it down. He took this fight and was like, I'm going to call Izzy and see what he has to say about it. Now, Izzy's gone one and two against Pereira, so he's got good information. But on the other side of it, it's, yeah, this guy's an elite striker that can take your head off at any point. So the problem with throwing so much volume is you're going to leave yourself open for counters. But again, he's never been hurt. He's never been knocked out. He's never been knocked down. It seems like Pereira's going to have to land that money shot. If not, he's going to have five shots coming his way. So super interesting fight. And again, that's the crown jewel of UFC 300 because it's super competitive and uh, there's a ton of intrigue on it. 100%. All right, co-main event. We've got the strawweight title of the, of the world on the line when... Zhang Wei Li takes on Yan Zhaonan. Minus 510 for Zhang Wei Li. Yan Zhaonan can be had for plus 385. You know me, Cody. When I look at this, I see these types of VODs, and I say the Pat Mayo special, the, uh, the CF dot model. CF dot model. How could it not be in play sure. here? Yan Zhaonan, I know that a lot of her fights leading up until the last time where she got the title fight over, you know, with a crippling first round knockout of Jessica Andrade. A lot of it was pretty uninspiring. Not the greatest volume sometimes, not just inching by in some fights, losing some split decisions. Don't get me wrong, I think Zhang Weili should be the favorite. She's shown crazy, crazy improvements in her wrestling ability under the tutelage of uh, Henry Cejudo and all of them. But we're looking at a four to one. Women's straw weight. This division, the fights typically are relatively, relatively close if they go the distance. I don't know. I think it's uh, from a betting perspective, it's a dog or pass situation. Yeah, I feel like it's probably relatively competitive and probably does go some rounds. It's the all battle of China, which one will prevail? But yeah, for me, I got to go with Zhang Wailei. And and it, to me, it's the wrestling. So no doubt with Yan Jonan, you look at the path to victory and how people beat her. It's the ground game. Her fight with Carla Esparza, she gets taken down three times and gets mauled by Esparza. Now, Esparza, not really a potent finisher, one of the better wrestlers of the division, but she gave up those takedowns so effortlessly, and she has no get-up game, no game up her back. Her subsequent fight with Marina Rodriguez, she drops a split decision. Again, like Paul says, she got a couple takedowns herself, but she's low volume. She lands 56 significant strikes over the course of 15 minutes. It's just not enough. Mackenzie Dern takes her down twice. Mackenzie Dern has no wrestling. And then her last tight against Jessica Andrade, the fight's over before it starts. Like, Andrade never shoots a singular takedown. Andrade was at a weird point in her career. The, the thing for me, though, is you look at where she looks vulnerable, it's getting taken down. And if you're getting taken down by Mackenzie Dern, problematic. If you're getting taken down by Carla Sparza, not problematic. But if she's just absolutely ground and pounding you into oblivion, problematic. So when you look at Yanjin, when you look at uh, Wiley's, Zhang Wiley, sorry, Chinese names, which one do you pronounce first? I think you guys hear what I'm saying is that she's got that wrestling, and you've seen her apply in pretty well every one of her fights. She takes down Rose Namajunas five times, impressive. Took down Joanny and Jacek three times, highly impressive. Uh, Carla Sparza didn't take her down, but again, out grapples Carla Sparza. And I'm not trying to use MMA math, but you see that there are levels to this. Sparza takes down Yan, it's a fish out of water. Meanwhile, Z Zhang Wailei, she's got excellent grappling. She's able to secure the rear naked choke. She can transition, she can scramble, she can back get back up. No doubt about it, she can also strike. And I think she could win this fight if it's a striking affair. But why not just take that path of least resistance and that's the takedowns. And again, her last fight against Amanda Lemos, six takedowns, 163 significant strikes landed, and a knockdown. What's the path for Yan? Is Yan just gonna cold cock her like she did in Drogge? Well, she better hope so. Because if she doesn't, she's gonna be getting grinded on, she's gonna be taken down, she's gonna be getting you know, give up a back, give up the rear naked choke. If not, you're going to be getting TKO'd from uh, just flattening out on the bottom. So, yeah, is it a heavy-duty price for women's MMA? No doubt about that. I'm not going to disagree there. But there's a rightful favorite, and there's a very clear path to victory. So I, I can't play contrarian here and take the dog. I think Zhang Wai Lake gets the job done and probably looks good doing it. You know what's even dumber and more of, like, contrarian in my mindset? Yawn, yawn round one, 30 to 1 is out on the market. You could bet some PGA Zhang golfers for 31 as well that probably Zhang have a better chance. No but way! I mean. Zhang Wei Li, 
Got knocked out by Rosanama Yunus. Head kick. Round one knockout. Fair. Je Jessica Andrade, last time out, gets cold cocked, knocked out, first round, 30 to 1. I'm just saying, I'm not saying, I'm just saying that I'll probably degen a little bit a little into bit. that. I can't help myself. I can't help myself sometimes, Cody. That's why we bring you in to have the rational takes, whereas I just want to take dog shots most of the time. All right, we got a great fight here. It's the, the BMF belt is on the line. Justin Gaethje taking on Max Blessed Holloway. Minus 160 for Gaethje, plus 140 for Holloway. I'm just going to say right off the top. I see a lot of people, and I understand the volume mentality, everything like that, with Max, Holl with Max Holloway. Nobody's better. This fight goes the full distance. Nobody's able to keep up with those numbers. It just Even in fights that he's lost, like the Dustin Poirier fight, yeah. it's like he's still a volume in his opponents. It's just his opponents are landing the sterner the stiffer the more damaging shots and over the course of five rounds you kind of see him break down his durability is off the charts everything like that i just have never liked max holloway at lightweight simple as that i just think he's undersized against all of these guys and um gaethje you know the mobility of max holloway is huge uh for getting in and out of the pocket landing all those shots so quickly Gaethje's going to be attacking the hell out of that leg. And I don't know if Max has faced a, a leg kicker like Gaethje. So, Gaethje, right, rightful favor for me. What about you? Yeah, I actually have pretty much the same opinion. Max Holloway is a legendary fighter. He's a first ballot Hall of Famer. He's paid his dues. He's done everything that you could ask from a guy to do. But at some point, you're now flirting with the idea of jumping up a weight class. You know, you're a dominant featherweight. His run at featherweight is pretty well done. Can't quite get past Alexander Volkanovsky. There's a whole shift there. The main thing is, is that, yeah, like Paul said, Max has done this before where he'll jump up and take on these bigger power punchers. Now, no doubt he's the volume guy, and we've talked about volume and power before, but power and volume at 205 kind of does make a difference. At 45, he can land two, 300 significant strikes, and these guys tend to take it. When they return fire on him, it's the more damaging blows, and that's what the judges tend to look at. Paul made mention, you'll never see a fighter in the history of the UFC land as many total strikes, significant strikes, as Max Holloway. He's coming off 75 over Chang Sung Jung, who lasted 23 seconds into the third round. Prior to that, 147 versus Arnold Allen, 127 versus Volkanovski, 230 versus Yair Rodriguez, 445 versus Calvin Cater, 102 versus Volkanovski the other time, 134 versus Volkanovski prior to that, 129, 180, 190, 174. It's all, it's all sickening volume. But again, how has he fared when he's gone up against those larger opponents? And the Dustin Poirier uh, fight that Paul mentioned is a, is a prime example of that. He outstrikes him 181 to 78. At no point did that fight feel close. It felt like Max not has moments, but lands a few shots. Dustin eats the shots like nothing because he's used to fighting the most murderous power punchers a division up. He can take what Max delivers and return fire. And it's not that Max can't take it, he's got a great chin. It's that, again, it looks better to the judges, the bigger shots being landed. He's had a lot of success versus Volkanovski, a guy that has campaigned at 55, but again, it was much of the same. He's landing the quick little leg kicks, he's landing the jab, he's landing that volume, and Volk would come back with the bigger shot, and that's what would secure the rounds. Gaethje, Gaethje's hard to say he's in the prime of his career because he's starting to get a little bit older and he's just had so much wear and tear, but he's fighting some of the best fights of his career right currently. He, no one's ever defended the BMF belt. Gaethje has an opportunity to go out and do so. And coming off a win over Dustin Poirier and Rafael Fazeev, both fights aged extremely well. One has to imagine he's in pretty good form right now. Going back to the Fazeev fight, it's a it's a slow start for Justin Gaethje. You know, Fazeev is just faster, he's more athletic, he's more dynamic, he's landing these great shots. The longer this thing goes, Gaethje is a BMF. That's why they got the strap around him. He's not going away, he's not going quietly. You quite literally need to knock him out. And the guys that have done that, Michael Chandler, Dustin Poirier, murderous power punches. Max is not that guy, so he's gonna have to outpoint him for 25 minutes and they couple that in with the Gaethje leg kicks, those big hooks coming forward, the momentum swings. One has to say Gaethje gets the job done. Now, it's an interesting fight because we probably think it's going to go 25 minutes and it's going to be 25 minutes of just straight car crash action. So the judges got to get it right. But the money line's not so crazy right now, Justin Gaethje, that you wouldn't be willing to take that shot. So I'm going to agree with you. I got Gaethje just being the bigger, stronger, more powerful man. All the respect to Max Holloway. He's a BMF for stepping up, but he's unfortunately going to drop not drop the title, he's not the champ, but I, I think it's going to be an and still for Justin Gaethje. All right, we got Armin Sarukian taking on Charles Dobronx Oliveira. Minus 200 for, uh, for Armin Sarukian. Charles, 
The people of Forgotten Charles can be at for plus 170. Where, where are you at with this one? Yeah, I need a dog pick at some point. And Charles, obviously my guy, he's a horse racing guy. He's just a very likable character. And, and there's no fight that Charles Oliveira doesn't have a chance in because he's very dynamic with his grappling game. He's the all-time UFC submission leader. And he's got some nasty striking as well. The thing is, Charles has always been not exactly a defensive wizard. He takes a whole lot of shots and he tends to take a whole lot of damage. And you're seeing a lot of these fights, he is getting beat up and then he finds a way to come back. And I mean, there's a whole list of them. His fight with Michael Chandler. The first round, he gets outstruck like 30 to 10. He's taking a beating against Chandler. He finishes him in the second. Dustin Poirier knocks him down. Charles is on skates. He's done. He comes back and he beats him. Justin Gaethje knocks him down, puts him on skates. He comes back and he beats him. You can only get away with that for so long. You can't just be getting Homer Simpson every time and find a way to win. It's just not going to happen. And so Islam Makachev, fair, drops him just like everybody else. But he's got the ground game to survive once he has Charles on the ground. And then Charles beats Benil Darius. That's fair. What I'm getting at is guys that are strong wrestlers that can avoid that takedown and cause Charles to strike. Yeah, he's got some hot power in his hands. But defensively, his head's straight up. He doesn't move. He doesn't really cut any type of dynamic footwork. He's there on a straight line to get hit. And with Armin Sarukian, I mean, he's only been taken down by two guys in the UFC. Islam Makachev and uh, obviously the former KSW champion. It's just... It's, I'm not apples to oranges. I just don't really see Charles Oliveira using a wrestling heavy, a wrestling heavy game plan to constantly ground him. So this will probably be a striking battle. He'll have moments. He'll land some good shots. But at some point, Saruk is just going to hit him with that right hand and topple him over. Both guys coming off wins over Benil Darius, both guys by knockout. Both guys have power. Sarukian's shown that he's got a decent chin on him. He's young. And the pictures that have been surfacing online, I don't know who his strength and conditioning coach is, but boy, oh boy, that guy uh, is taking his job real seriously. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, he may have worked with Barry Bonds, who quite literally has veins shooting through his forearm the size of garden hoses. So I don't know who's the drug testing regulator at this point, but Armin Sarukian is coming in world-class shape. And again, you got Charles is just a fighter. He likes to fight. But in this specific matchup, if he can't take down Sarukian, which I don't think he will, he's going to be forced to stand with him. He's a little bit longer. He might be a little bit sharper. But at some point, Sarukian returns fire, hits him, and topples him over. So, again, it's not a fight that you love the line because it's just straight violence. It's straight violence between two premier guys. You're betting against a former world champion who's finished guys like Michael Chandler. He's finished guys like Dustin Poirier. He's finished guys like Justin Gaethje. He's the man. And you're betting against him. Feels a little bit weird. But it's all about time and place and where both guys are at this point in their career. I do favor Armin Sarukin to get the job done. Yeah, I get that. Um, it is a pretty tricky matchup in terms of just getting the fight to the mat. I, I expect Charles to probably come out hot, have some real success early. But outside of getting knocked out super, super early in his career against something called an Alexander Bellick at Cup of the World Borders, uh, in 2015. Well, was he 19 years old? Yeah, exactly. Hasn't like... been knocked out. Obviously, he took that. Uh, we're talking about Armin. Armin took that super short notice fight against Islam Makachev, which we knew at the time was like, wow, like the cojones on this kid to come in and take this fight on such short notice are just like off the charts. And then now, like, how much is that age? Like, that performance being relatively competitive against the guy who's the current champion of the division, a guy who absolutely just mollywopped Charles Oliveira. Um, that fight going to the decision looks pretty good um, in hindsight. The Gamrock fight was a bit of a stinker, but Gamrock can do that to guys, just kind of makes fights It was a five-round fight, too, and if you look at it from a three-round scenario, I think Sarukian wins. The one yeah. that worries me is when he fought Joaquin Silva, who's not on his level. Joaquin Silva rocks him. He never hits the ground. He gets rocked. He kind of has stanky legs and then proceeds to go out there and knock out Joaquin Silva. So it might be similar in the Charles fight. You might get rocked. You might do the stanky leg, but you got to clear the cobwebs and and go back to what you do. Sarukian also on the table is that maybe he scores takedowns himself. Do you want to hang out in Charles Oliveira's guard? Probably not, but guys off their back are not nearly as effective as guys on top. And with Charles, if you're ground and pounding him and he's throwing up arm bars and triangles, yes, yeah, something's gonna sneak through and possibly rock this guy. So when you've lived a career of just performance bonuses and fighting you know, high octane performances, foot on the gas the entire time, at some point, age is gonna catch up to you, damage is gonna catch up to you. And again, I just honestly feel like Sarukian's the fresher guy, in shape, headed upwards, and Oliveira's just this, this guy with a legendary name and a reputation that Sarukian's trying to steal. You know, this will be a, um, in the future, when we look back on it, this will be the guy everyone forgets that was on UFC 300. 
who was Bo Nichols opponent? Cody Brundage. We got a Cody on the card. We least. got Bo Nichols a minus 2300 favorite. Uh, Brundage can be had for plus 1100. I mean, it's pretty writings on the wall. We know what they're doing here. They like this type of platform, this type of show. It's just like, here's our future star. Here's the guy that we think is going to be the champion of the division, Bo Nickel. It's a Bo Nickel fight. Every Bo Nickel fight right now, we've been saying it every single time. It's just like, they're basically unbendable. We think he's going to absolutely smash his opponent. They're, they're building him up because he hasn't, he doesn't, just doesn't have nearly enough MMA experience. But, I mean, I wasn't betting on Bumdidge against just about anybody right um i won't be stepping in front of bo nickel what about you yeah i mean the money line what can you do with it but i think everybody's going to take this one inside the distance bo nickel excellent wrestler we know that but yeah he seems to be putting pressure on these guys that are a lot less than him and breaking them down he's not someone that's faced any type of adversity so that does make you wonder how good is his chin how good is his resolve how good is his ability to overcome a potentially bad situation he's just not been in any bad situations paul when you look at his first three fights two on the contender series against donovan beard and zachary borgo and then this fight with jamie pickett these guys landed a collective one significant strike they had three guys combined for as many hits as dexy's midnight run is it's, it's just not a good spot to be in right so when i look at his level of competition it's extremely low it's just not all that good he's trying to build himself up and the ufc's done a really good job of taking him up the slow way but it's not that Cody Bunridge isn't the right opponent for him right now. It's just it is UFC 300. And you've got one guy that sticks out like a sore thumb on the card, which is Bunridge. Now, I'll give him one thing. When you look at Bo, Bo is wrestling is phenomenal, but he hasn't exactly taken on anybody that would be considered a decent wrestler for the most part. Bunridge would be considered a decent, not good, a decent wrestler. He's got college experience. He's training out of the Rockies. He's supposed to have some okay cardio. My problem is... Paul references him as Cody Bumridge, and nobody disagrees with that statement because when the going gets hot, he tends to find a way out the back door. A lot of these fights are just so sloppy. He's getting gassed out. He pulled, he had pulled guard on Rodolfo Vieira. No ring IQ. Why? And it's a fight he's winning. He drops Rodolfo Vieira. He's not looking all that bad. And jumped he, Gilly, he jumps guillotine and uh, it's essentially pulling guard because as soon as Rodolfo pops his head up, it's like game over, pal. You best. spend eight weeks getting ready for don't go on your back. Don't end up with this guy on top of you. And then you pull him on top of you. It doesn't make any sense. You look at some of these other fights. Cedric Dumas, he landed three significant strikes over 15 minutes. What is going on here? And that's kind of the guys that Bo fights, is these guys that'll land three significant strikes over the course of 15 minutes. Super low volume. This fight with Rodolfo Vieira, Paul mentioned, pulls guard, bad move. You know, um, Mikey O, uh, Alexa Chick knocks him out. Nick Maximov had just outgrinded him despite him being a wrestler. And these are all just problematic because you know he's not durable. You know, he doesn't have a great submission game. And despite him being the wrestler, giving up four takedowns to Nick Maximov, Bo's just going to run you all, all over. Um, going back to his Jack, Jacob Malkoon win, which for Bunridge is the biggest win of his career. <laughs> In a fight he's absolutely getting dominated in. Gives up his back. Yeah, yeah. We, is it a, is it an elbow in the back of the head? Quite possibly. Because he's ear muffing himself and only giving you the back of his head because he wants out. He wants the ref to stop the fight. The ref does stop the fight and unfortunately disqualifies Jacob Malkoon. So awful, awful, awfulness. But the facts remain. I mean, the guy doesn't have great takedown defense. He's not a great grappler. He doesn't have any type of dynamic striking. He's probably on paper the best opponent that Bo Nicholas had to face, it's just still not enough. So Bo romps this guy. I'm thinking under one and a half. Bo, I want to say by TKO, submission is obviously on the table though. So you're probably going Bo inside the distance. And again, hard to believe that this one would get into the second round, let alone deep into the second round. So probably that under one and a half. But on a minus 2300 money line, sure you can parlay him up. It's just not going to do anything. 100%. All right, we got uh, Alexander Rakic taking on Yuri Prohashka. On the main event of the prelims, Rakic, slight favorite, but like depending on you know the book that you go, that you look at, you may have a Prohashka favorite. It's pretty much a straight pick, him, Cody. Where are you at with this one? I'm actually confused on this one. I don't know why it's even money. I, I don't know why Alexander Rakic is a slight favorite. So if you're looking for an underdog, I don't even know if you could consider Yuri an underdog. But yeah, he would be your slight underdog play. Looking at Alexander Rakic, there's so many red flags going on here. So one, he's coming off a, a long layoff, a near two-year long layoff for starters, jumping back not only just back into MMA, but you're jumping back in there with a former world champion, a guy that's extremely dynamic and dangerous. So it's a tough fight to come back from. Huge red flag that he's got the two-year-long layoff. We'll talk about Yuri's layoff, but just for Rakic, it's an even longer one. 
Last time you seen him, he blows his leg out against um, against Jan Blachowicz. It wasn't exactly a spectacular performance prior to that. He probably is up two rounds, and then he hurts himself. So it's also a red flag that he hasn't fought in two years. He's coming off an injury in a fight, in a fight that he was otherwise kind of somewhat winning, and then he hurts himself. So again, not a guy that you would probably want to back. But when was the last time you watched Alexander Rakic fought and thought, this guy looks good? Because it's been a minute. It really has. Yeah, he hasn't fought in two years, but the Blockwitz fight didn't look good. He was getting outstruck 31-27 to 27 when the finish came. His fight with Thiago Santos, it went 15 full minutes. He landed 36 significant strikes. He got outstruck by Thiago 49-36, to 36, and he somehow won the decision. He looked awful. No volume. Uh, no, no killer instinct. He's fighting a guy that can't even hack it in the PFL ranks right now. Bad look against a guy that is, is past his prime. Not a good performance. His fight with Anthony Smith, not a great performance. His fight with Volkan Uzdemir, where he squeaked out a split decision, not a great performance. And then you go back to him fighting Jimmy Manoa, Devin Clark, Justin Ledet, Francois Barroso. Yeah, he beats those guys. The last time he looked good would have been Jimmy Manoa. That was five years ago. Since then, he's been going through the motions. And it's not like he's going through the motions against the best guys. You know, Volkan Uzdemir is a gatekeeper to the division. Anthony Smith's a gatekeeper to the division. Thiago Santos is cut from the division. Jan is a former world champion. That one would have aged well. But he looked like crap. He had landed 20, 27 significant strikes going into the third round, or mm -hmm. already in the third round. And then he hurts his leg. And then he takes two years off. He's 32 years old. He has really no real big notable win on his record. Like, in what world is this guy... A pre-fight favorite. This doesn't make sense. Yiri, meanwhile, let's talk about his red flags. Yeah, he's got a na nasty surg uh, shoulder surgery he's coming off of. Will that affect him? Could be. They said it could be career, um, you know, career threatening. So it must have been obviously severe. But Yiri's just a wild man. I mean, you know he can wrestle a little bit. You know he can grapple. You know that he can strike. He's constantly coming forward for you. And when you look at his list of opponents, Alex Pereira, Glover Teixeira, Dominic Reyes, and the fight with Volkan Uzdemir. Just against a higher level, you know that he can bring that pace, you know that he's got that length, you know he's got that power. I can see a world where he just hurts Rackage and knocks him out. I can also see a world where he maybe switches up the script and shoots the takedown. The fact that he's got a fifth round submission win over Glover takes here, he's dangerous at any point in the fight, he's got skills standing, he's got skills on the ground. Yeah, it's his comeback fight, but you know the way this guy fights, he's just gonna tune out the noise, tune out the pain, and give you a berserker type performance. So yeah, it's a 50-50 fight because both guys got red flags and both guys fight, you know, this and that and they're not the most trustworthy. But Yuri's got power, he's got offense, he's coming forward to deliver. And with Rakic, he's super low volume, almost looks like he's avoiding the fight most of the time. Been off two years, bummed his leg his last time out. There's really no redeeming factor for why I personally would want to bet on Rakic. So, got to go with Yuri. But you're expecting a greasy fight between two guys banging it out in front of a hot sold out crowd in Las Vegas. Does 50-50 on the odds line seem fair? Okay, sure, it seems fair. But if that's the number, I'm taking Yuri Prokoska. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm on Yuri as well. Um, I just think, yeah, the, it's a, more of just like the numbers game. I think if it turns into an absolute dogfight, you want Yuri who, I mean, even even the fight uh, with, with Dominic Reyes. So like he landed what like seventy seven significant strikes and like that finish was like pretty early in round three wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's like that was just it was I in don't, round two. If it turns into like that type of fights, like I don't think Brackets can keep pace with like that type of action, right? Like it basically cooked uh, Dominic Reyes as well. So um, yeah, both of these guys have red flags. I I mean, I can understand this line a little bit more if you know. If if one of them was like fully healthy and active recently, but it's like Rackage has been on the shelf longer than Yuri, so um, yeah, but, I think he's got the bigger question. Marks. And keep in mind though, if it comes down to it, and both guys are hurt, and both guys aren't what they used to be, Yuri is a samurai, so they go with Sabuku, which is death before dishonor, and uh, yeah, that's the mentality he brings to the table, and that's the mentality I'm looking to back with my money. Nice. All right, we got uh, Aljamain Sterling making his featherweight debut against Calvin Cater. Minus 170 for the former bantamweight champion um, in Sterling. Cater can be had for plus 145. I'm curious. It's always weird, like, obviously, moving divisions if your game plan is to wrestle. Not that Aljamain Sterling has to wrestle here. He has I enough, he, I would think he has he enough volume to. that he could make this a real competitive fight, I think, just striking it out with Cater. But, like, my big question mark here is, like, who has tried to wrestle... Not many guys have no, really haven't tried had to success. wrestle. Um, Emmett, did Emmett even try? Emmett shot two, and Dan Ige shot like nine. He stuffed all those, so yeah, I mean, that doesn't look bad. It doesn't look bad at all. Well, I think it's a kind of a, a 
it comes down to the wrestling for Aljo for me. And if he's not able to get those, like, I don't want to lay a minus 170 on him, to be perfectly honest. If I think it's going to be like a competitive stand up uh, fight between two guys that both have great volume and Cater probably, like, not even probably, definitely has more power uh, in those shots. So. We haven't been picking too many dogs here. Calvin Cater will be one for me. What about you? Yeah, again, I'm in the same boat. Need to make a dog pick at some point. And then it's just interesting that you have the weight change and you have Calvin Cater maybe keep keep it as a striking battle. It definitely does lead some credence to, yeah, Calvin Cater could go out there and spring the dog upset. <clears throat> for me, Aljamain Sterling seems to be in his own head. When you look at him, he's a great 135-pound champion, but a lot of these fights, you know, his fight with uh, Peter Yawn the first time, Yawn gets himself disqualified. In a fight, otherwise, Aljamain's about to lose. The second time he fights Peter Yon, he just backpacks him for three of the rounds. You know, he does a good job of controlling round time, but not exactly of fighting per se. Uh, TJ Dillashaw's got a bummed out shoulder. Henry Cejudo's a former 125 pounder. And then you run to Sean O'Malley. This one's interesting to me. You had come off a performance where you took down Henry Cejudo four times. The path of victory to beating Sean O'Malley is very clear. It's very obvious. Yep. You're going to go in there and take him down. Why would you want to strike with him? I, I don't know. Sterling goes in there with a clear blueprint. I just took down... Uh, a U.S. Olympic gold medalist multiple times, I'm just going to go take down Sean O'Malley. Instead, he decides not to. Not really sure what the game plan was there, but he just kind of bounces off that range. With Peter Yan, you saw him throw volume, but he didn't against Sean O'Malley. Against other guys, you've seen him shoot takedowns, but he didn't against Sean O'Malley. And then in the second round, he just kind of runs headfirst into a counter punch and gets knocked out. Then he's super vocal about how he didn't want to really take that fight. I, I shouldn't have taken it. Then he goes to grappling. He's going to take some grappling matches. He loses, he's losing these grappling matches. Kevin Danzer, he doesn't want to engage him. It's a grappling match, you get on top of him. No, 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 don't want to. And then they book him in a grappling match versus Chase Hooper, which he wins by split decision. So his grappling at 135 is elite. His grappling at 145, at 155, it eventually starts to diminish. His wrestling abilities is fantastic at 135, but coming off a fight where he was reluctant to shoot on Sean O'Malley is worrisome. Got knocked out bad. He gets knocked out by Sean O'Malley, his worrisome. He's 34 years old. He's very clearly mad at the UFC and that they're not giving him these spots. And I want a rematch versus Sean O'Malley. And they're like, no. You got a bantamweight champion, defended the title multiple times, steps up when you need him, and they're refusing to give him a rematch in the title fight. So Aljamain's a little bit all over the place. He's searching for a new home. And to move up to 145, I mean, that 10 pounds is going to be critical because how does Aljamain win his fights? Okay, well, he can mix in his wrestling and he can use that superior volume, but the volume doesn't really carry any power with him. He can hit you 100 significant times, but it's mostly just jabs and leg kicks, jabs and leg kicks. No real defining strike coming out of that. Mixes in the takedown's great, but as Paul mentioned, Calvin Cater just presents a whole lot of different problems. His takedown defense in the UFC is 91%. Guys that have tried to take him down, Dan Inge is a decent wrestler. Arnold Allen is a good wrestler. Josh Emmett is a collegiate wrestler at a team alpha male. Guys have tried, they just not really had any success doing so. And when you don't take him down, he's capable of landing 130 against Josh Emmett, 144 against Giga Chikots, 133 against Max Holloway, 105 against Dan Ige. He's all volume all day. He does have a little more power than Aljamain Sterling. I wouldn't consider him a murderous power puncher. He's got more power than Aljamain Sterling. He's got a fairly brick wall takedown defense. And again, you've got a bigger, stronger man. People will say, oh, he's 36 years old. That's fair, but he's taking on a 34 year old Aljamain Sterling coming up a weight class. So. For Cater, this is his last chance at relevance. Obviously, he wants to wash the taste of that last defeat out of his mouth and get back on the winning column. And I think sprawl and brawl type tactic would be the way to go. Last but not least, one little point I want to throw in there is that Aljamain Sterling went on record after the Sean O'Malley fight being like, I let the crowd get to me because I shouldn't have fought an exciting fight. People want an exciting fight. I should have just grinded him up against the cage and held him there and had the worst fight in the world, the most boring fight in the world. That's what I should have done. That's his mentality. It's not looking to fight. He's looking to hold on to you and secure rounds. So in this fight with Cater, if he's just looking to backpedal and land jabs and leg kicks and shoot some rinky-dink takedowns, the crowd's hot. Vegas is looking for action. They're looking for damage. And he's not landing the damage. So it's a live underdog spot for Calvin Cater who figures to land tons of punches, the bigger punches. And if you can stuff the takedowns in the mix, he's live. He's live at 145 all day. So I'm going to back up with you on that one and uh, take Calvin Cater's dog number. Well, we got Yuri Prochaska's, so to speak, ah, dog yeah, number one. But you want a real dog, we'll go with Calvin Cater for dog number two. So Ke uh, Kayla Harrison's taking on Holly Holm. This is a bantamweight. Yes. I think that's a massive factor to this fight. No Kayla, Kayla's a no minus 440 favorite. Uh, Holly Holm can be had for plus 340. Um, 
I correct me if I'm wrong, but like Kayla Harrison said that she's like never like she has been on record before saying that she was never going to cut down to 135, I believe. Yeah, well, she's been on record saying that essentially she couldn't make 135. Yeah, it was pounds. like she would have to like cut off of a li- like I don't know if I- I'm not going to quote her, but I feel like the words like cut off a limb. I mean, I guess we'll find out at weigh-ins on Friday. Yeah, well, uh, that would it. be pro- problematic considering she's a wrestler, Pat. She, if she had to cut off that arm. Um, We've seen this in the past with like high-profile women's bouts. Is that there's not enough challengers in all the divisions, so at some point you're expected to go up or down. And when you have already de- defeated all the girls above, then you're forced to go down. With Chris Cyborg, everyone wanted to see Cyborg versus Ronda Rousey at 135. Ronda Rousey, not the greatest of all time, despite what her deluded brain is telling her, her deluded concussed brain is telling her, not the greatest of all time, but but she refused, outright refused, I would never go up to 145 to fight Cyborg, she's got to come down. Cyborg tried, Cyborg did the whole, I'll cut my leg off if I have to, but she physically couldn't make the weight. Harrison's at a weird spot, she fights in PFL, she's won a couple million dollars in the tournaments, but she's kind of also run into Larissa Pacheco now at 145, that maybe seems to have her number. So, to find new life and to sign with the UFC, there's no 145 division. You're not fighting Big Norm. Nunez You're not fighting is Jermaine Durand me. Nunez is retired. There's only one game in town, and that's 135 pounds. So it's not like she wants to do it, and we're not even sure that she can do it. It's that she has to. She has to try. She'll have a really good strength and conditioning coach. She'll have a real good nutritionist. She'll have a real good team around her of medical experts that'll help her get to the weight as safely as humanly possible. But there's a huge difference between dehydrating yourself 20, 30 pounds and then stepping into a steel cage quite literally the very next night. So. I think she's very live to get the win here. I think three round fight definitely helpful in that yes. respect. We've yep. seen her definitely fall off of like the, the cardio fall off a cliff against Larissa Pacheco, who you were mentioning earlier. Holly can be taken down, Holly can be controlled. But minus four forty is a big it's a big ask, I think, in, at this price with like all of the question marks of how she's gonna perform on fight day. Um, I think Kayla Harrison will get takedowns early. Is that gas tank gonna hold up in re- like later in round two and round three? I'm not entirely sure. I think it's a clear dogger pass, probably a pass for me, but uh, do you have an official pick? Yeah, well, I mean, when you talked earlier about the CF dot model, it's just taking this big plus money on the women's underdog. This one feels way more CF dot model than Zhang Wai Lei, who I figure is gonna go get the win. But yeah, it's like you, Kayla Harrison could look good in the first round, and if she tires due to a bad weight cut, then Holly Holm figures to take over. The reason why I just find myself pulling the coward card on this one and going with Kayla Harrison is Holly Holmes' last performance against Mara Bueno Silva where she does look old, she does look every bit of 42. That mobility, that ability to to kind of dart out in and out of the pocket, to move laterally, to counter punch, it seems to be a little bit diminished. Mm -hmm. And you see with Mara Bueno Silva, once she closes the distance and pins Holly Holm up against the cage, she's a lot stronger in the clinch. She's able to lock up this little ninja choke. I would think that Kayla Harrison, if she can make 135, she's going to be strong. She's going to be physical. She's going to be coming forward. She'll have that same ability to press Holly Holm against the cage. She'll have that same chance to get the takedowns. Will she get the submission? I don't think so. But all the same, the ability to control the fight, dictate where you want to take place, likely on the ground, and just continuously grind on Holly. There's no doubt at 42 years old, Holly Holm, not what she used to be. You give me a prime Holly Holm versus this version of Kayla Harrison all day, I'm interested. It's that writing seems to be on the wall, and with Holm, she hasn't particularly looked all that uh, spectacular in the last number of performances. So the UFC knows what they're doing. They got Kayla Harrison, not exactly spring chicken herself, long history in judo, long history over in the PFL, now making a UFC debut. They need to get this girl to a title shot as quick as possible. And how do you do that? You beat someone with the name of Holly Holm. So the UFC knows what they're doing on a marketing standpoint. It's up to Harrison to make the weight and go out there and perform. But I I will back her and think that she does get that done. All right, we got Diego Lopez taking on Super Sadiq Yosef. Minus 135 for Diego Lopez, plus 115 for Super Sadiq, who you got? Yeah, this one puts me in a bit of a bind. So Diego Lopez has been costing me a bunch of money because I don't mind fading him. I don't think he's all that good. Now, mind you, he's got a lot of finishing abilities. He's got nasty Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt, super opportunistic with his submission attempts, constantly throwing stuff up, has competition experience, and then you see him in the UFC, arm barring Gavin Tucker, a fellow BJJ black belt. Diego Lopez's grappling is pretty legit. His striking, it's not terrible. You see him coming off a win over Pat Sabatini in a fight that Pat Sabatini fought like an absolute mook in, but Diego Lopez has got a little power. He's got a nasty submission game. He's one of those guys that's wily. Thing is, is that I don't think his wrestling is very good. He stands tall upright. He's there to get hit. 
and even though he's like a constant threat of the submissions, if those submissions aren't sticking, he, I think there's opportunity for his opponents to get some work done. Sodiq Yusuf, meanwhile, hardcore fans of the show will remember we hit a PRP last year fading Sodiq Yusuf. So again, he's not exactly the end-all be-all guys, but he's very intelligent, he's a, very, he's a sharpshooter. He spent a lot of time at Team Lloyd Irvin, so his jiu-jitsu is quite good. And there's no doubting, he had Essen Barbosa done. You know, if, if that fight gets finished, we're not having this conversation. But what I like about him is he's someone that's very uh, analytical, searches his opponents, has good striking, has some decent power, has cardio at times. And even though he's not exactly fought his best fights in recent memory, there's no doubt that you can go to a whole bunch of these spots and say, you know, him versus Edson Barbosa loses. He landed 178 significant strikes and the one knockdown. He's fight with, I don't know, I mean, I guess his fight with Andre Feely doubles him up. His fight with... I guess he's got some nice little knockouts in the mix, Gabriel Benitez. And then you go back to his contender series fight a long time ago against Mike Davis, lands 111 significant strikes, has cardio for days. Again, he's someone that doesn't seem to be able to get over the hill, get over the mountain peak, and kind of break himself into that top five of contention. But there's a lot of good skills there. With Lopez, he seems more live or die by the takedown. And he's not getting the takedown. His opponents are taking him down. Mavzar Ivlov took him down. Gavin Tucker took him down. Those guys are taking him down. Sodik's not going to do that. He's going to play range, dance around, let this tall plodding guy move forward, and just sharpshoot move, sharpshoot move, sharpshoot move. Got to mind his P's and Q's, but he can use a point fight style and win this fight, I do believe. So I will go with underdog number three, technically two, however we want to look at it. That plus money on Sodik Yusef, I'm willing to try to fade Diego Lopez one time. The end is coming near for Diego Lopez. I don't know if it's this one, but I'm hoping it's this one because I'm fading him once again. Yeah, Diego Lopez has been uh, very, very entertaining along the way. And in fairness to him, it's like against Mobstar Evlo. He got taken down four times, but it's like he was pretty impressive hanging out yes. from bottom. Like that's where we were like, okay, this guy has some potential here. Um, he's had some pretty, uh, pretty awesome finishes, obviously, since then. Pat Sabatini. Pretty one-dimensional, just a grappler. And did he Obviously, shoot the no takedown? Exactly. What are you doing, Pat? Exactly. It's just like you could. Pat Sabatini's one of the guys that could have hung out in that range, and he just, you know, the, the fight was over in a minute and thirty seconds. But yeah, it was weird. Um, and yeah, Sodik. We, yeah, we faded him obviously against Edson last time out, but that was striker versus striker. I guess the bit the there's a there is a bit of a red flag there that Edson Barbosa, who is not known for being a wrestler, was able to take him down three times. So eh, this fight could end up in the range where Diego Lopez wants it. But uh, I'm gonna side with you. I think that you know Sodiq will have just enough takedown defense to keep this one upright and at range he should have massive advantages there even if he does because you were talking about Lloyd Irvin if he does get taken down to the ground he does have the skills to at least probably survive potentially Diego Lopez has been pretty difficult there I wouldn't be surprised by this one like going to the decision to be perfectly honest like yeah a, yeah I, I a Yusuf see by decision prop what is what's that paying out here obviously me I'm always looking to get a little bit extra greedy uh, it's plus 250. It's not too exciting. Plus yeah, I know. Fight, fight goes the distance is plus 135, and that covers you on both sides. Yeah. If, if Diego just doesn't like hit his submission and doesn't knock him out, which I don't think he's going to knock him out, if he just doesn't finish him. Dude took a beating against Edson Barbosa, but took it. And then flip side to that, if I'm wrong on Sodik and he doesn't crush Diego Lopez, or he does fight, I am right, he fights that point fight style. He gets style, taken down and then gets has taken to down, hang out. Moves away, uses his jab, uses some leg kicks, and mostly just doesn't try to engage the you know, the all action guy in Diego Lopez. And this thing's gonna hit rounds. If it hit rounds, they got a listed over one and a half, which I love, minus 180, and then the fight goes the distance outright at plus money. Not a terrible look if you're kind of torn on how this fight goes or who wins the fight, but you think it's gonna get some rounds in, then the total's not a bad look. Not a bad look whatsoever. All right, we move on down. We've got uh, Jalen Turner taking on Hanato Moicano. Turner's a minus 230 favorite. Hanato Moicano can be had for plus 195. Your thoughts? Yeah, Money Moicano looking to uh, go out there and cash the damn thing. The thing with Moicano is that he's not ex extremely dynamic, I wouldn't say. I don't think his wrestling's all that good. He does try to put pressure on guys, but his striking lacks a little bit. And to me, it's more so the volume. His fight with Drew Dober, it goes 15 full minutes. He lands 23 significant strikes. Matt Rid or Brad Riddell, he had landed 10. First round, I get it, but only 10. Rafael Dos Anjos, fight goes 15 min or 25 full minutes. He had landed a career-high 88 because it was a five-round fight. But then you go back, 33 against Alex Hernandez, 26 Jai Herbert, 15 
he gets finishes in the mix, but it's a lot of it is he gets a quick submission win. When I look at Jalen Turner, Jalen Turner's just got all these variables to his game. He's six foot three with a 77 inch reach. He's got solid takedown defense. He's got nasty, nasty power. He can touch you pretty much wherever he wants in that octagon because of his ability to reach in on opponents. When you look at his takedown defense, 75% in the UFC, but the guys that have taken down, Matus Gamrot, <laughs> I'll give him a pass on that one. Mm -hmm. uh, He's been digging down Jamie Malarkey, Brock Weaver, but he pops right back up. Matt Frivola took him down four times. That was problematic. Matt Frivola is a power wrestler. Um, Matus Gamrot's a power wrestler. Those guys are, have an ability to go out there and establish multiple takedowns and slowly break down Jalen Turner. The more you grind on him, the more you can force the takedown to him, the more he will tire. The more he tires, that's when you have a chance of fighting your way back into it. But with Moicano, he's not that guy. You saw him in his fight with Rafael Dos Anjos, he couldn't keep RDA off of him. He doesn't really have that nasty offensive wrestling, I think, to continuously pressure Jalen Turner. He doesn't have the volume to stand with Jalen Turner, and he certainly does not have the durability to allow Turner to tee off on him for two rounds. So, it's another fight where it's like, do you love the money line? Like, not really, because the thing about UFC 300 is they've gone all... Outside of Cody Brunridge, who's a massive underdog for a reason, it's all the best guys in the sport. And so you can't disrespect any of these guys because they've got no. tons of back class, tons of experience, and tons of legitimate skills. This is another fight that personifies that. Moicano's a legitimate top five, top seven type guy. But with Jalen Turner, the tarantula, I've been really high on this kid, his potential, his development. I think he's trending in the right direction. And a win over Moicano would just do wonders for his career. So sign me up for Turner to get the finish. Yeah. I'm I'm a, I'm with you 100. percent And like I would have, I was a big believer in Moicano, but like that fight, like I know you, maybe I'm getting like a little bit too dead set looking at this like the last performance that he had, but Drew Dober, Drew Dober is a guy that great kickboxing, but Moicano's wrestling should have just absolutely just dominated that fight for pillar post and. Yeah. He was able to get the takedown in round three to like hold position, hold on for dear life basically, and squeak that one out. We've been seeing with like a lot of these scorecards too. It's like, is that enough? Is that Did enough? You if you just get takedowns and hold position without any sort of any sort of ground and pound whatsoever, it's like the ref may or the judges may remember like, oh yeah, he landed a good strike like in the first minute before he got taken down. Like it's. It can be a little bit dicey. That performance against Dober was like a real, a real problem. We forget too that it's like Moigano was a 145 pounder as well. I know that he was like very big for 145, but Turner is Turner, frankly, is 170, 100 percent. Yeah. Yeah. If he put on a little bit of meat, maybe he's even he's a he's a middleweight potentially. So there's a lot of things that I don't like about Moigano here. I understand why Jalen Turner is. A significant favorite. I'll imagine he'll be pretty high up uh, in your PR PRP charts this week. Maybe not top line, but uh, he's going to be up there in the mix. Got to take some risks and some chances. And yeah, again, Turner's a guy that we like. And Moicano's, he, he, he's developed a fan friendly character where he talks some game online, and does a good post fight interview. But I think we're getting away from, like Paul mentioned, he left the 145 pound division for a reason. And, and again, I'm not saying he has durability issues, but when Turner puts hands on him, I think you're going to see him busted up, bleeding, second guessing himself, and then things are going to get uh, greasy for him. I wouldn't be I wouldn't be stunned by a, like a Turner first round knockout, to be perfectly honest. Um, very, very dynamic. I, I, we are leaving out to like Turner, if the fight does get extended, does get a little bit ugly, but Moicano against Dober in that fight, his cardio wasn't looking all that great as it, as it went into the third round either. So. Yeah, and again, when you look, it's like, oh man, he's got gas problems. It's like, okay, the two fights that he lost where he did definitely gas, Matus Gamrot, right? he outstruck Gamrot, it's the takedowns, and it, he still loses a split decision against an ultra-competitive top-end guy. And then his fight with Dan Hooker, he came out looking like a million bucks. The thing with Dan Hooker is if you don't knock him out, you don't take this guy all the way out, he's just going to turn into Nate Landwehr, and he's not going to go away. He will not go quietly into the night. Uh, Turner outlanded, or didn't outland him, he was outlanded 125 to 100. Still landed 100 significant strikes. Still fought one hell of a round and a half. Unfortunately, the tide had turned. Moicano doesn't have that type of pressure of volume. Do you think he's going to Dan Hooker him and march forward and eat everything, including the kitchen sink, and land 125 significant strikes? No, Moicano's not that guy. That pressure that guys like Dan Hooker and Matus Gamrock can bring to the table is not what Moicano brings to the table. And that's how you suffocate and break down Jalen Turner. Last but not least, getting gassed out, going those tough fights, fighting world-class guys, and just coming short on these back-to-back -back split decisions, right? 
you're going to learn from that. Turner's still young, he's still improving, he's still getting better, and no doubt he can go back and address those issues. So hopefully this is a career best version of him. And on the biggest stage of his career, that is what we're expecting. All right, we got uh, Jessica Andrade taking on Marina Rodriguez. Andrade is a minus 140 favorite, plus 120 on the underdog. Uh, Marina Rodriguez, where are your thoughts here? Yeah, I think it comes down to is Jessica Andraj back because we all know when she's at the top of her game She's a former world title uh, Champion she's a former world champion has challenged for the belt has won the belt has been there done that she's fought in all the who's who If you look at the whole list of fighters that she's been in against She's never ducked a fight. She's always been there and then at some point not young It's just more so wear and tear. She's a near 45 veteran. She's just kind of going through the lulls She's very so vocal, active. very vocal about how she's going through a divorce and she's got to pay for essentially the entire thing Had lost a big chunk of money and just need to fight to make up for that as a result You get the Aaron Blanchfield fight where she looks lethargic the, the Yan Janan fight doesn't look good Tatiana Suarez fight I can't say she looked good in that one and people are trying to write her off myself included the Mackenzie Dern fight, she's a betting underdog against somebody that she should take her lunch money. And and Andraj comes back. She's reinvigorated. She puts an absolute beating on Mackenzie Dern. And that's when Jessica Andraj brings to the table. Four knockdowns against Mackenzie Dern. That's crazy. Prior to that, her fight with Lauren Murphy. 231 significant strikes landed over a tough grinding type fighter. Her fight with Amanda Lemos, you know, arm tri standing arm triangle choke in the first round. She's a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt. She's one of the stronger girls of the division. She can wrestle. She can absolutely hit like a Sherman tank. The problem is, is just like where her mentality is at and how much motivation does she have. So again, she's not an old fighter. She's just got a whole lot of mileage under her. Marina Rodriguez, meanwhile, She's 36. 36 years old. Surprised she, that she's older than Andrade, right? Significantly older than yeah. Andrade, right? And, and doesn't have half the amount of professional fights. So on one hand, she's a lot fresher. On the other hand, at 125 pounds, at this weight class, speed is everything. Your ability to, you know, keep pace with your, your contemporaries is super important. And I just don't know that she quite got it. People will say she looks spectacular against Michelle Watterson in her last fight, and she did. But Michelle Watterson, very much a now near 40-year-old fighter, uh, hanging out on the challenge. Shout out to Pat Mayo, likes the karate hottie from her time on MTV's show. But yeah, she's a mother. She's got other gigs outside of it. She's got a training program. She's got you know personals that she's been teaching. She's been doing some karate stuff. It's, it's a good win, but it's not the end-all be-all wins. I go back to, to uh, Verna Jandaroba, takes her down three times and dominates her. Amanda Lemos took her down just the one time, tons of success with it. Jan Janan took her down twice, Mackenzie Dern took her down once, Michelle Watterson the first time took her down once, Amanda Ribas took her down once, Carla Sparza five times, Cynthia Calvillo three times. Overall, she'd be rocking a 66% takedown defense, which ain't bad, but it's the chain wrestling. She might stuff the first two, the third one takes her down. If Josh wants to just run forward and box her up, female John Lineker style, which we've seen her do, work the body, there's a chance that she runs headfirst into that mm -hmm. Marina Rodriguez right hand. It's on the table. If she's a counter puncher, she got a nasty right hand, and Josh could run face first into it. If Andrade fights her the way she fought, you know, let's say Rose Nama Yunus, which is pick her up and dump her on her head. If Andrade fights the way she fought, you know, just a lot of these girls where she's been able to use that physicality to muscle her way to the ground, to fight within the pocket, to not give up a whole lot of space and range, and to constantly put that pressure on. The 231 significant strikes she landed against Laura Murphy, use that type of approach and march Marina back. Don't give her space to operate with. If Andrade is back and she's reinvigorated, this is her fight to win, but... Do you think all the women's MMA favorites are going to win on this card? Because I've already got Kayla no, Harrison. No, I've been, I've been I've picking got, against most of them. I've yeah, been, so, so at some point I think i got to buck up and take something. And Marina seems like the best women's fighter on the card in terms of springing the upset by just catching Andrade with that counter right hand. So I'm going to go with Marina Rodriguez. Don't like it, probably the PRP pick, but that will be the selection. Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. Like The problem is that Andrade just doesn't really go out there and wrestle against anybody. Like... In fairness, she's been fighting the top of the top of the class. Like Mackenzie Dern, it's like, well, you'd be stupid to even try Why to wrestle you want with to, her. Sure. Tatiana Suarez is just like, you ain't wrestling. <laughs> You're not wrestling with Tom. Yeah. Uh, Blanchfield's got elite wrestling. Same thing, you know. It's been so weird with Jessica Andrade because, like, yeah, she does look like an absolute murderer sometimes. And then there was that definitely in this stretch here, like that Blanchfield fight's like good first round and then everything just fell off of a cliff and you kind of see like Blanchfield what she's done after after that it's just like the strike like looking back on the striking that like Blanchfield put up in that fight you're kind of like what the hell is going on with with Andrade Blanchfield was landing a ton in that fight exactly is, and then and then when you think oh well Josh looked back to her last time well Mackenzie Dern can't strike so is her striking back I don't know but on paper Marina Rodriguez probably does have at least 
a avenue and a advantage. And so if you're looking for a dog that's going to cash out plus money, they need an obvious path to victory. And the counter punching, the four inch reach right advantage, hand, that all does play in a factor. And Andrade doesn't wrestle enough. I wanted to disagree with you, but I'm going to side with you because all I do is pick women's underdogs. One that's of them's going to hit. If you can get one of the big ones, then you're set. But uh, yeah. if you lose your first two and you got this one, at least it would minimize the damage. Yon Jao Nan, round one, 30 to one, just pays for pays for everything. Just covers the entire the entire bill of UFC 300. Um, it probably has no chance. Uh, moving on down, we've got Bobby Green taking on Jim Miller. Minus 205 for Bobby Green. Jim Miller can be had for plus 175. Jim Miller was on UFC 100. Jim Miller was on UFC 200. And Jim Miller is on UFC 300. Lyme disease. <laughs> he, if it was up to him, he'd be game, yeah. Lyme disease couldn't stop this guy. Yeah. That probably will, yeah. And he would be a prime candidate. Cause, Con uh, yeah, Connor versus Jim Miller, UFC 400. I'm in. Um, I'm in. I would be down. I would be down. But yeah, I like Bobby Green. Yeah, yeah, I like Bobby <laughs> Green too. Again, Bobby Green, I think the worry is like how, how banged up is he? Because Jalen Turner put a life changing beating that's on fair. him. And Herb Dean really didn't do him any favors in that fight. So Bobby's someone that's been around the block a few times over. And I'm not saying he's slowing down. It's just at some point, you're not fighting your opponent anymore. You're going to start fighting father time. Bobby Green's a 50 fight veteran. He's 37 years old and he's coming up by far the worst defeat of his career. So are you going to get a 100% version of Bobby Green? N not likely. Jim Miller, meanwhile, he won at UFC 100 and he won at UFC 200. And he's looking to solidify himself as a bonafide badass and get the win over UFC 300. No doubt he's resurrected his career. No doubt that he's definitely, you know, brought himself competitive. He's got a, a solid little boxing, decent little right hand with some pop on it. If he can drop you and get you to the ground, you in trouble. If he can take you down and get you to the ground, you in trouble. But he's not relying on his wrestling anymore. Jim Miller from UFC 100 was a grinder. He wrestled guys. UFC 200, you know, he still incorporated it. UFC 300, he's a little bit slower. He's a little bit more flat-footed. No doubt he can go and get the win. But on paper, a guy like Bobby Green is just very problematic for him because he's got excellent footwork. He's got better volume. He's got a nasty jab. And Bobby Green, for as quirky as he is and as much of a character as he is, his takedown defense has really never let him up. Yeah, his law Makachev will take him down and ruin him, but you got to really stick to a wrestling-heavy game plan, and Jim Miller's just not doing that. So more than likely, what you're going to get is something that resembles closer to a sparring match. Miller's going to try to pick his spots, inch forward, try to line him up for that right hand. Bobby's going to be shaking his head. He's going to be doing the shoulder roll. But ultimately, the jab and the ability to just maintain distance should allow Bobby to just pick away at him. Could Bobby knock out Bob Jim Miller? Yeah, possible. But Bobby's not a power puncher. He has knocked out... A couple of guys, a handful of guys in his career. The most notable one, obviously, being Grant Dawson, who he flatlined in 33 seconds. But prior to that, he had not knocked out an opponent. And they'll tell you James Krause yeah, was I would, kicks I the balls. Was, I was always betting him by decision, like pretty much every single fight. He's, up until he, he's a decision guy. Oh, yeah, 100%. He's a 100 percent decision guy. So for Jim Miller, he's got enough left in the tank that I don't see him getting crumpled over by any one of Bobby Green's shots. I just don't see him having the speed to constantly chase down Bobby and land his own shot. So the only thing that could really screw Bobby Green in the spot is that Jim Miller is a perennial fan favorite, uh, consummate professional, and the definition of a blue-collar working man. The crowd will be behind him, as they usually are. Bobby's a little more ignorant. He shakes his head when he gets hit. He plays games. And you need these judges to be on board that the idiot is actually winning the fight. Because if they don't like what he's doing, or they don't, or they think it's a sign of disrespect, and they're not fully going to give him his credit, then a guy like Jim Miller is going to keep these rounds close. If we think it's going to go to decision, right, then these rounds are probably going to be close-ish. If they're close-ish rounds, and it goes to the scorecards, you you got to make sure that your judges like the dude doing this all the time. Because not everybody likes that. So no. Miller, you know, he's a savvy dog that finds a way to get it done. But yeah, I got to give you guys legitimate picks here based on legitimate analysis. Like on paper, Bobby Green has the style to defeat him. So the pick is Green. Just can't take any uh, respect away from Jim Miller and what he's done. Kind of crazy that the fight that opens up the card is between two former champions, Davis and Figueredo taking on Cody Garbrandt, minus 305 for Figgy. Uh, Garbrandt can be had for plus 255, obviously. The fight's at bantamweight. Figgy was always struggling to make 125. Um, and frankly, 
we've been backing. Like, we haven't been Cody Garbrandt haters on this, like, resurgence back up while he's fighting lower-level opponents. Like, I've been backing him because, like, the, the numbers have just been kind of right to do that since the Kaikara France knockout. I think Davis and Figueredo is not, like, that Cody bumchin, as I think you have called him before, is showing back up, getting knocked out. So I, I think my favorite bet on the entire card, frankly, Figgy, Figgy by knockout plus 140, Figgy uh, by knockout round one plus 400. Um, I think Cody Garbrandt's going for a canvas snap. Yeah, I would say so. And again, when you look at this card and how loaded it is, UFC came to Toronto, long, first time in a while, blah, 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 Strickland do place. It's okay, it's a good fight. Beyond that, what was on the card? You got Raquel Pennington versus Marabuena Silva. Give me Cody Garbrandt versus Figgy over that crap. Uh, Mike Malaw versus Great Bill Magny. Is that a main card fight on a pay-per-view anywhere in the world? Probably not. This card, again. It's Davidson so Figueroa, good top to bottom. Bobby Gar or, um, Davidson Figueroa versus Cody Garbrandt headlines a fight night anywhere. It co-main events most pay-per-views. Jim Miller versus Bobby Green, that headlines a fight night pretty much anywhere. Go and look at cards after UFC 300 and what's headlining those. They've used all their star power in one spot. So we're here for it. It's not the kind of card you can say, I gotta miss the first three fights and I'll catch up on it after that. Everything's banged up, ready to go. With Garbrandt, he's one of these guys that's got all the skill in the world. He just doesn't have the durability. And we talk about this time and time again, Paul. Some guys are supreme athletes. They have striking. They have grappling. He's a state champion wrestler. He's been at a, a top camp for a number of years. He's a former world champion. He's got all these excellent variables going in his way. It's punchy kicky. And what is your ability to take the punchy kicky? Some guys like Julian Rosa can't take no damage, but he finds ways to win. It's got to be the certain opponent. When I look at Cody Garbrandt, this resurgence, he beats Brian Kelleher. He beats Trevin Jones. Okay. Trevin Jones is released from the promotion and is currently losing fights on the regional scene to nobody. It's not a quality victory. It's a win. It's a confidence builder. It's not a quality victory. His fight with Brian Kelleher, who's in his late 30s, is a DJ, and uh, just one foot in, one foot out. It's a win. It's a confidence booster. It's not a quality victory. So now what he has is no real quality victories, but confidence. And that confidence is going to see him step up to Davidson Figueredo in a very ill-advised spot and get his head blown off. He's got sharper technical boxing than Davidson. He's got better speed than Davidson. He's got on paper you know, better wrestling than Davidson. But but Davidson being a 125er doesn't mean nothing. He's the biggest flyweight I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. And him campaigning at 135 is where he should have been. Without having to kill himself on these weight cuts, he's going to carry exactly the same amount of power he had over. He has very solid takedown defense, very solid get-up game, and he's one of these guys that you start feeling good. Oh, I landed a combination. Oh, I landed a jab. You step into that firefight for one second too long, and he's going to knock you out. And with Cody, he fights emotionally. If you hit him, he's got to get it right back. You know, Pedro Munoz, he hits him, he's got to get it right back. He tends to run into the fire, and I just don't think Davidson's that guy. So. You could make, you know, on other fights you'd say, well, Davidson's a 25er and he's coming out taking a, a, on a world champion. Like, Garbrandt's a 25er too. Tried one time against Kai Car France, mm -hmm. got obliterated, and then decided he didn't want to do the weight cuts either. But when you see these guys side by side, truthfully, Cody Garbrandt is not any bigger than Davidson Figueredo. And in fact, it's quite the opposite. So I feel like Davidson, the size, the strength, the power, at some point, this gunfight is going to. Yeah, Cody's it, a, little break bit, out. And, a little and bit taller, point, but the other everything else about him same and like Davidson's gonna be carrying more muscle and being his second fight at bantamweight he's gonna have a little bit extra time to you know fill out that frame put on extra muscle that he wasn't carrying around at 125 obviously he had the decision win over Rob Font um, you know a little ways back there yeah, and again, that one's it's his move up to 135. So he had fought Brendan Moreno, lost. It's his first fight at 135 pounds as Rob Font. And people would say, well, he didn't rock, knock out Rob Font. Font puts up huge volume. Because he was able to everybody. wrestle him. He took yeah. him down four times. It was like, took Cody Garbrandt, I'm not sure he's going to be able to wrestle him. So it's like, they're going to hang out in the pocket and sling. And uh, yeah, I, I think that like I, yeah. we, we backed Cody Garbrandt against Trevin Jones because we're like, wow. We know he's been getting knocked out, but like there's levels, and Trevin Jones is not at that level. And then we backed him against Kelleher because we're like, Kelleher, not exactly a great wrestler. Yeah, he's knocked out some guys, but it's like we're talking about levels again. Well, now he's stepping back into the fire against someone who has a championship level. Like, I think, yeah, Davis and Figueroa will knock out. Yeah, yeah, I agree. My favorite by far. Yeah, I hate to say, card. I hate to say, Cody's are gonna go 0 and 2 on UFC 300, but uh, hopefully one Cody could go 13 and 0 outside of UFC 300. That being me, now PRP this week's gonna be extremely difficult because again, all the variables. But 
Yeah, I, I, with him. I think you nailed it with Cody Garbrandt. It's that not that he doesn't have the skills to win. It's just you know, it's going to get into a firefight. This is going to be one of those back and forth type tilts where he might be landing shots, but at some point, you know, he's going to get hit back. And the one thing that I really do like about Davidson is he's got as much power in his left hand as he does in his right hand. He's an orthodox fighter, but at some times he'll throw lead hands on both sides. And Cody Garbrandt's got a, a big problem with throwing naked leg kicks in the pocket. He stands in the pocket and he tries to counter with his leg kick. Someone's going to slam him straight in the face. And when Davidson has you hurt and smells blood in the water, ask Joseph Benavides how that one goes. He is relentless with pursuing the finish. So Garbrandt's not had any moments where he got seriously hurt, came back, and won the fight. He needs to coast top to bottom because if he faces any type of adversity, he usually succumbs to it. So got Davidson. And listen, would I like to take more underdogs on this card? Yeah, because it's a big card. Dogs are going to be coming through. I just think the favorites have been placed in the proper spots. UFC 300 odds have been out for a long time, so they've been steamed accordingly to where they're supposed to be. And at this point, finding that meat on the bone in terms of getting a big underdog is going to be a little more difficult. But yeah, we've outlined three, potentially four dogs that we do like on the show. Hopefully those are the ones that come through. And then the guys that are supposed to do their job, well, we're going to need them to go ahead and do their job. 100%. All right, we're just about out of time here. But before we go, hit him with the PRP code. Hit him with the PRP. So this week we are going with... Alex Pereira, tough one, but we're going to go with Alex Pereira, Zhang Wailei, um, sorry, my, I don't know if it's the internet just cut out, anyway, it doesn't matter, we're going to go with Pereira, Zhang Wailei, Justin Gaethje, Armin Sarukian, Bo Nickel, Yuri Petroska is dog number one, Calvin Cater is dog number two, Kayla Harrison, Sodik Youssef is dog number three, Jalen Turner, Marina Rodriguez is dog number four, Bobby Green and Davidson Figueredo, so I'm not taking the coward's way out, I got four underdogs, but yeah, I think people want a three, plus 300 underdog, a plus... You know, Plus 3,000, round one, women's strawweight uh, knockout. Yeah, That's one thing. If, you don't, things, well, if you don't have you a don't dog have to put you like, the house on that, though, right? Take like, a plus money prop that you like. So there's, there's other spring. ways to get plus money. And, of course, the degenerate in me will just tie some of these safer favorites together and then hopefully hit my, my plus money. But uh, I'll admit, last week I saw absolutely zero world, zero possibility. There's no way. There's no way that Corey McGee beats Alex Morono. And like, it was a greasy ass fight, Paul. Why are these fights that shouldn't be competitive, competitive? Because it's the fight game. It's why we're here, it's why we love it. Every dog's got a shot. Um, we're just in the business of trying to hit the right favorites and the right underdogs. And hopefully this week it comes together because this, be this would be the big one. It's a big fight for everybody. If you're, whether you're a fight fan, whether you're a fighter, whether you're a media personality, whether you're just you know involved in the game whatsoever, so uh, if anybody, if everybody could go out, have a good time, make some money this weekend, I think uh, that would be the best result, Paul. 100%. All right, that is it for us this week. Hope you enjoyed the show. For producer Pat Mayo, Jeff Feinberg, who's who's been hanging, and Cody Saftik, I'm Paul Shaughnessy saying goodbye and good luck. Oh, oh, oh. Oh.